I talk about tonight's speakers. We're very lucky to have two speakers for the main part this evening. I'm going to introduce them one at a time as they come up to speed. Uh, and they'll each speak for uh, uh, one after the other, and then we'll have a short break, five minute, ten minute break, uh, a comfort break for us to set up the stage. Then we'll introduce the speakers back onto the stage and we'll have a QA session. Uh, and then at the end, we have a third speaker, so to wrap up the whole event. Um, we have Matt Hubert from Syngenta, who's going to tell us a bit about Syngenta's interest in the car. So you've got a lot packed in tonight, and I'm really excited to go. Okay, okay, let's introduce our first speaker. Professor Simon Leather is a professor of entomology in the Department of Crops and Environmental Sciences at Harper Adams University. I was very lucky to get a tour of their department last year, and they have a fantastic new entomology uh, building. Uh, I think the paint's still wet with the building. Uh, so they've got fantastic facilities out there. Uh, Professor Leather also heads the new Centre for Integrated Pest Management at Harper Adams, and he's also the Director of Study of Aerosol Research Projects, looking at UK biocontrol. Now, I'm going to sort of give the names of a couple of those projects, start asking what exactly they mean. So one of the projects he's, he's, he's responsible for is triprofic interactions in mixed vegetable crops and novel methods for the mass rearing of predatory mites that biological control in glass houses. Um, he believes passionately in outreach. He regularly speaks to local schools, as well as uh, local history societies and other, other events. If you look on, in, on, on YouTube, you'll find several uh, videos of that uh, uh, speaking. Uh, and he also blogs uh, at Don't Forget the Roundabouts. And he can be found on Twitter as at Entoprof. That's E N T O Prof. -E so I'm very pleased. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Simon. Actually, it's not modern agriculture, it's agriculture itself that has caused the pest problem. So what we did when we invented agriculture was we bred plants to be palatable to us. And unfortunately, what's palatable, palatable to us is also palatable to pests and diseases. What we've done is we've taken the chemistry, reduced all the defenses, and made them nice and tasty so that we can eat them. Apart from cabbage, of course, which is still pretty dangerous if you're a kid. <clears throat> you probably don't know, but uh, the stuff in cabbage is bad for your kidney and livers when you're a little kid. So your kids, when you force that cabbage on them or when you were a kid, you knew best. It's not good for you. Dad, why are you poisoning me? So anyway, farming has caused the pest problems, not modern farming, farming in general, agriculture. And we can have, ev we've got all this sort of stuff from the Bible, you know, there's plagues, locusts. And we have evidence from early crop protection. So there's a little thing there, the Bayeux Tapestry. There's a, a little boy there scaring birds off the crops. We've got an ancient Greek chasing birds with a sword. And of course, we've had scarecrows for time immemorial. So crop protection has been around a long time. But crop protection was very human-based. It was dependent on small boys with sticks, boys with stones, uh, wives going out and picking pests off vegetables, things like that. Uh, and of course, man's very ingenious, <clears throat> and people have tried very hard to come up 
with ways to protect their crops before we had a chemical arsenal. So this is a, an interesting device invented in America in the 1860s. Uh, the orchards uh, had a big pest with uh, weevils and plums and apricots. And uh, this ingenious device was supposed to irrigate your trees at the same time as you controlled your pests. Uh, ropes were attached to branches. You pressed the pump. It shook the weevils off. You caught them up, put them into a big pot, and burnt them. Uh, <coughs> and you can imagine this probably didn't work very well, because you would need a lot of string, plus a lot of very strong people to move the pump handle. Uh, and if you look at the sort of things that were around, they were very physically based, uh, things like little hopperettes, uh, locust uh, mops, if you want to call them that, fly traps, sticky bands, so all sort of based on uh, catching your pest and then usually burning it. They seem to be very keen on burning the pests once they've caught them. Uh, <coughs> this is another example. So this is, works a bit like a, a moat. So this was about chinch bug. And uh, you basically dug a ditch in front of your crop as the invading pests advanced, filled it with kerosene because this was an American device. And as they fell in, you then dropped a match in and burned them. So it was a very sort of um, hit and miss, very responsive uh, cr crop protection. <clears throat> I've put this one in because humans had pests as well. Uh, so this is a, a rich Georgian lady, and this is a flea control method. And this is based on the, uh, the fact that fleas are very keen on warm areas where the blood is close to the surface. And what the rich ladies did, they had a nice silver flea trap here, which was filled with flea bane, and you baited it and you stuck it into the warm place, and the fleas all were attracted to it and died. <coughs> that was the theory. Um, I don't know how well it worked. Uh, there were some chemicals around. So the ancient Greeks knew that elemental sulfur was good uh, at killing fungi. So elemental sulfur has been used a long time. We still use it now. Uh, and of course, we had all these very broad spectrum, so broad spectrum they were more fatal to humans uh, than they were to the pests, so copper sulfate, arsenic, uh, tar oil, and which of course and you, you end up with uh, Bordeaux mixture. Uh, so not that effective against the pests, but very effective if you wanted to uh, kill one of your relatives. Uh, so basically, as farmers, as horticulturalists, as uh, growers of all description, you had a very limited armory. So basically, you had to sort of rely on something else. And this is how biological control first came about. And biological control means different things to different people, which I'll explain a bit later. And it, it rose to prominence in the 1860s. And this was because the United States Department of Agriculture uh, were very far uh, sighted. They were looking into the future. They realized they didn't have anything really effective at controlling these pests that had come in with all their new crops. Uh, and the USDA at the time was staffed by a lot of English entomologists. Uh, and as a result of the lack of effective pesticides, they had to start looking at other things. And what these guys noticed, uh, and I should say actually that biological control is actually older than that. The Chinese, for example, used to um, move ant nests into their citrus orchards and then put bamboo poles between the trees to encourage the ants to move between trees to control the pests. The Bedouins uh, used to take ant nests to their oases so that the ants could protect the date palms. And Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's granddad, wrote in his day book uh, how he'd noticed that his cabbages in his garden were being attacked by cabbage white butterfly larvae but also that the larvae were being attacked by parasitic wasps. And he hypothesized that this might be a good way of controlling things in the future. So back to the 1880s, uh, only the Americans came up with this idea that they had exotic pests attacking their crops. Where did the pests come from? And they went, worked out where the pests had come from, went to the countries where the pests had come from, and looked at what was eating the pests there, brought them back, reared them up, released them. And very luckily, a number of these things worked. So the plum problem in Missouri, fixed by biocontrol. Uh, the citrus, citrus industry in 
Uh, California saved by a ladybird beetle and a parasitic fly, which at the cottony cushion scale. Uh, Hawaii sugarcane industry, which was threatened by a weevil, solved by introducing a parasite. And same with the rhinoceros beetle in Mauritius. So these things seemed to be working really well. They became really popular because there wasn't anything else to do. So people were throwing biocontrol agents all over the place. Uh, and not all of them worked very well, but that's another story. Then we have, um, I guess I just, before I move on with the history, this is what biological control is defined as. So although it had been around sort of scientifically for 100 years or so, we don't really get the classical biological control definition until the 1960s, about 100 years later. So basically you're looking at parasites, predators, and pathogens which maintain your pest organism's density at a lower average than it would occur if they weren't there. And the, the important thing is that it's not eradicating, it's controlling, it's maintaining them at a lower pest population. And this is a theory, so you have your pest, your disease, whatever it is, it's operating above your economic injury level, you introduce your control organism, again, could be any sort of biological agent, it hopefully reduces the population of your pest or disease, and it takes it down below the economic injury level and all is well. So that's the theory. Uh, and that's what people were sort of working on up until the 1920s. And of course, in between 1914 and 1918, we had the Great War, and one of the great atrocities in the Great War was the use of chemical warfare. And what people noticed, certain people noticed that the human parasites were also killed by the chemical warfare. And that started the agrochemical industry, basically. Okay, so out of war came an agricultural boom. So we could then have the age of pesticides. We go through uh, a number of different uh, chemical classes, starting with the organochlorines, which the French first came up with in the 1920s, moving through the organophosphates, the carbamates, the pyrethroids, the insect growth regulators, the neonics, there's been this constant sort of development of pesticides. And these things were incredibly successful. They were easy to use. They were very, very effective. And those early organochlorines, DDT, were incredibly safe to us. The mammalian toxicity was incredibly low. There's some fantastic footage that you can find on the internet somewhere of a baseball stadium full of pregnant American women being sprayed with DDT to show how safe it was. My dad was a Marine in the Second World War. Once a week, they dragged them out from the bowels of the ship, lined them up on deck, and sprayed them with DDT. And there's nothing with me. Uh, so, you know, it was very, very safe. The problem is, of course, that because it was so safe, because it was so effective, people used it all the time. And just like we have the problem with antibiotics, with the medics, we've got the problem with resistance. And basically, it's, it's why I always worry when I see that advert on telly, kills 99.9% .9 of known germs. What's about that other 0.1%? What are we producing? And this is, of course, what resistance is all about, that natural enemies are not all equally, not natural enemies, Pests are not all equally susceptible. They may escape by some way. They develop resistance. And pests are pests because of their pestiferous habits. They have great ability to adapt and reproduce. And they are actually much better than natural enemies at surviving these sorts of things. So you end up with resistance building up in the pest populations and the predators falling behind. And you end up with a resurgence. And we now know that there's more than 500 arthropod species that have already become resistant. And 200 weed species are resistant to herbicides. Some of this resistance has been around a long time. Housefly, resistant to DDT since 1947. And the curve doesn't look very uh, encouraging. It's going up. Resistance is growing. Then we also have uh, the non-target organism. So it's not just the pests that are developing resistance. We are causing problems elsewhere with this overuse of the pesticides. So Rachel Carson drew to our attention in Silent Spring the fact that although these organochlorines were very safe for mammals, they were building up in the food chain and we were ending up, uh, she was able to show us uh, 
the, the top, uh, top of the food web, the predators, the birds of prey, as they laid their eggs, breaking their eggs because the eggshells were so, so thin. If you were a cannibal in the 1960s and 1970s, you were in big trouble if you wanted to eat Americans because according to the FDA, Americans contained more organochlorine residues than you were allowed to have to be edible. So it was a big problem building up in the food chain. We also have, of course, the problem with our natural enemies, the collateral damage, and as is in the news all the time now about pollinators and how they too are affected by overuse of pesticides. So that leaves us with molecules disappearing, chemistry becoming harder to uh, get hold of. And remember, of course, that insects are very clever, that if they are become resistant to one uh, compound within a class, they tend to be able to become resistant across that whole, whole class of chemicals. So we can run out of chemicals very quickly. So biological control is probably where we ought to be looking at uh, very more, much more seriously than we are. So to go back to that heyday of the 1880s. And biological control is sort of divided up into different classes. There's classical, there's augmentation, there's conservation, and within augmentation there's inundative and inoculative. I'm just going to quickly tell you what those are. So classical is the, what people came across first, which was you introduce an exotic organism to control an exotic pest. And the idea was that that, once introduced, it maintained itself and looked up, kept your pest problem down. Conservation biological control, which probably many of you use, but you may not call it conservation biological control, is where you modify the environment or you use your pesticides in such a way that you actually preserve your natural enemies or increase their numbers. So things like crop islands, things like conservation headlands can all be used in conservation biocontrol. Augmentation, uh, which is where you basically increase the numbers of natural enemies, uh, you either inundate your crop or you inoculate your crop with mass-reared natural enemies, which is one of the things that uh, we've been looking at uh, at Harper, for example. Uh, so inoculative, you release your mass-reared enemies to control a pest, and it's those natural enemies and their offspring that actually do the work. So that's been around in glass houses for a long time, and Rob, I'm sure, will talk all about it. Inundative is where you actually use the mass-reared natural enemy to do the control. So almost like using it as a pesticide. You release the natural enemy, and it works there and then. Uh, and glass house control has been around a long, long time. So when I was a long-haired agric student, I can remember being taken to a glass house, big glass house uh, facility, quite small compared to what they have these days, uh, over near Hull, and the, the owner there telling us how pleased he was with his, in this case, trichogramma, how it was controlling his pests and he wasn't having to use uh, chemicals. And of course, these days, it's come on a hell of a long way with sort of individual crop-specific natural enemies. Uh, and for those of us who sort of work more out in the, in the field, in the arable landscape, the glass house sort of control is what is our holy grail. We would like to see the same levels of biological control that we can see working very successfully in glass houses, working out on the farm landscape. And like the Holy Grail, it's probably an impossible ambition. But I think we can get some way to achieving it by looking at what we already have and then projecting forward how can we use what we have in imaginative and new ways. So, first of all, why use biological control? What's in it for you? Well, health, wealth, and happiness. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, some wise words from Thomas Jefferson, who points out that agriculture is actually really, really important. It might be ignored a lot, but it is something that produces real wealth. It's good for us as humans, and it produces happiness if we do it properly. So, that's one reason for using, well, three reasons for using biological control. If you look at biological control compared with traditional conventional pesticide use, 
Biological control agents, biological control is a sort of way of crop protection, has a number of advantages compared with using chemicals. And I'm going through these uh, individually. So biological control agents are very selective. They can be pest specific. And they tend not to intensify your pest problem as you get with the resistance of resurgence. Uh, as chemical control can do. So they're very selective. Uh, this is a little bit of a red herring, but uh, we, it's always cited when you talk to students, you always tell them this is a good reason for biological control. The beneficial organisms are already there. So unlike new chemical molecules, you don't have to make them, you don't have to uh, put them together, they already exist. So you don't have a manufacturing process, which isn't strictly true. Um, they are able to locate their prey themselves. So they can seek out and find the pest organism. So you don't have to do a lot in ways of dispersal. You can release them. This is talking about whole organism biological, classical biological control. And the biocontrol agents go out there. They do the job for you. They're living organisms. And resistance, the pest species, finds it difficult to develop resistance to the biocontrol agents. Okay? Many of these early biocontrol agents were predators. And if you imagine you trying to develop resistance to a tiger, uh, that's the sort of resistance you'd have to develop if you were a pest, uh, an aphid being attacked by a ladybird. Okay? You'd have to develop armor plate very quickly. So in terms of resistance, they're probably pretty good, or not susceptible to it. And theoretically, once you've released them, they're self-perpetuating. They go out, they make new biocontrol agents for you. So that's sort of the advantages of the whole organism, the classical biological control approach. There are disadvantages of biological control. It's not totally perfect, of course. Control slow. These are biologicals. They're not knockdown spray. It takes time for them to do what their job is. They also don't tend to exterminate the pest, unless uh, in gl glass houses you can get pretty good control like that. But out in the wider world, they're not going to kill all the pest. It's not an exterminator. And out in glass houses, they've got it really sus. They can control their climate. Outside, weather is unpredictable. And a lot of these biocontrol agents are weather dependent. What's happening? in terms of temperature, in terms of rainfall, can affect their efficiency. So they're not, at the moment, super predictable. And I said they're already present, so you don't have to manufacture them. Yes, you don't have to manufacture them, but you've got to rear them. So you've got to rear them in large quantities if you're doing inundative or inoculative biocontrol. So that is a manufacturing cost. And the early development and use requires expert supervision and research. You may have heard about the Japanese knotweed biocontrol uh, problem. That's been good. We've had MSC students working with CAVI for 15 years trying to develop an effective biocontrol against Japanese knotweed. So it can take a long, long time. So those are thinking about the, the, the biocontrol agents you can see. We do have another arm of biocontrol agents, the biopesticides, the microbials. And these are based on the diseases of your pest organisms. So they're the viruses, the fungi, the bacteria, and the nematodes, the things that in humans cause all sorts of nasty things, ranging from colds right through to instant death with uh, some of the viral infections. And they do the same things with insects. Some viruses and fungi only give the insects a bit of a, a twinge, others hopefully are totally fatal. So these are the ones that uh, we, we think about using quite a lot because they are easier for us to control and they tend to be more compatible with our conventional control methods. They have a number of advantages. They don't leave any harmful residues for us. They are really, really highly specific. You can have strains of some of these microbials that will only attack particular species. They can be extremely host-specific, so that you're not going to get collateral damage. With a 
little tweaking of formulations and little tweak of nozzles, you can pretty much use the same sort of technology that you use with conventional pesticides. They also work with conventional pesticides. The, uh, a lot of them aren't killed if you are using your chemical pesticides. Very hard for a pest to develop resistance to uh, a disease or a, an infection, and they are very non-toxic to mammals. So these are entomopathogenics, or they're herbi their um, mycoses that affect plants. They don't affect mammals. Though that said, my dad, who was an agronomist, did manage to get an aspergillus once, uh, which is quite a hard thing to do. Um, <clears throat> but uh, they do have disadvantages. They are slow active because they're biological. They can be too specific. They can actually require a specific life stage in the pest's life cycle. And if the pest has grown past that life cycle, the microbial doesn't work. Because they're biological, they need a minimum pest population. A chemical pesticide, it doesn't matter how low the population of the pest is, if they get hit by the pesticide, they die. A microbial needs to build up. They can, because these are very fast breeding organisms, so you rear several hundreds of generations in the manufacturing process, if you're not careful, they can lose virulence, which is, means you release something that isn't actually going to work. They do, in many cases, leave messy looking dead bodies. So the things that attack caterpillars leave a sort of squashed, uh, leaky caterpillar on the cabbages, for example, which your consumer might not want. It's all right maybe in forestry, but in cabbages, you've got to get rid of the, ca uh, the, the dead body. Again, climate is very important. A lot of these things won't germinate, they don't uh, spread properly unless they've got the right temperature, the right weather conditions. So you have some dispersal problems as well because they aren't entirely mobile, although some of them are very clever and cause behavioral changes in their hosts uh, so that they try to infect their friends and relatives. And of course, if you mention viruses and the outside world, the public, despite the fact you're telling them how safe they are, the public have real fears about viruses being released into the environment. Just a summary, biopesticides have a lot of advantages. They're less toxic. They generally only affect your target pest and closely related organisms. Effective in very small conditions, uh, con quantities. They often decompose quickly so you don't have a residue problem. They are difficult for the insect pests to develop resistance to. Disadvantages, slow, lack persistence because they, uh, uh, they sort of um, break down very quickly, UV gets them, uh, and they aren't available easily. You've got to sort of search them out, hunt them down, and breed them. Chemical pesticides, on the other hand, very highly effective, easy to apply, low cost, one of the reasons why we use them so much. On the disadvantages, you're looking at broad spectrum, environmental persistence, non-target organisms, uh, secondary pests arising, and resistance and toxicity to us. So on balance, the biopesticides uh, have got more positives than the chemical pesticides, although their disadvantages are also uh, just as many, but not as serious. So what you want to do is not re rely entirely on biological control. I don't see biological control being perfect. I don't see it being something that you can use as your sole method of control. It's part of an integrated pest management uh, exercise. It's, you use it with other things that are combat compatible or things that are going to work uh, uh, cheaply. So you can integrate, integrate a lot of your methods. You can think about application technology. You can think about partial plant resistance. Uh, you can think about how that lowers, makes the insects that are feeding on the plant more susceptible to pesticides, more susceptible to biocontrol. You don't need to use as much pesticides, so your biocontrol agents can, can work well. So you've got a, a virtuous circle here where you can combine application, uh, less persistent pesticides, biopesticides, partial plant resistance, and get a nice uh, integrated approach to control, not relying just solely on one method. And there's a whole pile of literature, much of which, of course, hasn't got uh, out to the public yet, even though some of it has been done uh, many years ago. 
ranging from relaxing your monoculture uh, to thinking about uh, a real, really diverse farming structure. And all these things that are up there, which are too many to read, are things that have been shown to work, at least in experimental uh, environments. And if we think about this as birational or biocultural, there are a lot of things that come out of it, not just the controlling your pest, but you've also got environmental and societal uh, benefits ranging from your crop right up to the landscape level. So things can look nicer if you're not uh, just using one crop and pesticides, for example. So it allows diversification. So in summary, you've got a lot of methods out there that you can use. And just because you use one doesn't mean you can't use the others. You can use them all together. Okay, and that sort of gives you your bio-rational, your integrated pest management uh, approach. So, what do I see the future holding for us? So, I'm, I see the future of biological control or biocultural or bio-rational man pest management as being divided into sort of four different um, areas. There's the plant itself. We know quite a lot now about what, how plants talk to us. There's the biopesticides, the microbials, and I've included, I'll go through uh, these in more detail. Then there's the, um, the sort of sophisticated technology, which an earlier talk has talked about, the, uh, the, the really high tech end of agriculture. And finally, and I'm only going to talk very briefly about this because we've already had one in the series, there is genetic engineering. So if we imagine our crop as a traditional huge monoculture, so this cabbage field is telling the world this is a cabbage field. It's a super cabbage. Okay? It's a huge visual signal to anything that likes cabbage. They can see it. It's also giving off a huge volatile perfume. And that is attracting all the things that love cabbage. Cabbage specialists can visualize this, they can see it, and they come into it. And we know a lot about the chemistry these days of, uh, of how pests perceive chemistry, which chemicals they respond to. Some of the work we've been doing at Harper Adams is, for example, uh, fixing uh, aphids up to electric circuits, passing chemicals over them, and seeing what they respond to. Okay? This has been around uh, a long time. You can stick little electrodes into aphids and see what they, what they like. Uh, so what you can do, thinking about intercropping, for example, is instead of having a wheat field, a bean field, and a cabbage field, and this is just a hypothetical combination, you pr put them together, and that, depending on how you sow them, how you uh, arrange them, and this could, of course, with ad advances in uh, sort of sophisticated uh, te cropping technology, uh, you could arrange them in all sorts of different ways. You could end up with, instead of a cabbage smell, a wheat smell, and a bean smell, you could end up with a melange. And that melange totally confuses the pests. They don't know what they're looking at. They don't know what they're smelling. They don't land in your crop. And that's something that we're uh, really interested in uh, developing. And we also know from uh, some molecular work looking at volatiles that what you grow next to a crop can actually tell your crop plant to do something different. So in this case, this is uh, work that showed that by planting uh, alliums, onions, next to, uh, in this case, the beans, uh, that it made the beans give off an anti-aphid uh, smell. So that's something you could possibly think about. How, how, does this, how can you grow things in combination that scare away your pests? And we know, we've known for quite a long time now, uh, that plants talk to each other. People laughed at this when it first came up in the 1970s, but we know now how it works. And plants tell each other if they're being attacked. They'll tell their friends and relatives, something's biting me, something's infecting me. And that tells the rest of the plants to get ready to be attacked, to develop resistance, to become uh, hard and tough. So that's something else we could think about. How do we get 
plants to prime themselves and be re resistant to the pests rather than the pests being resistant to your control methods. So what we're envisaging at Harper, and this is something we're uh, in the process of developing, is the idea of an electronic nose. And this nose, not only can it smell the plants, but it can smell whether the plants have been attacked by pest or a disease. And our hope is that we will be able to find specific smells coming off the plants that will tell you what pest or disease has actually attacked that plant. So you can use the smell to say, right, this plant has been attacked by a, a specific aphid or it's got a specific disease on. And then envisaging the advanced technology, the robotics that are out there, we have the electronic noses fixed to some sort of drone or some uh, harvesting, sewing, whatever machine you want to think about it, that's robotically operated. It's out in the field, it's sniffing, it says, aha, this is attacked by an aphid, and it either puts a chemical pesticide on, because you could use your, your chemical pesticides through, or it could put a biopesticide, deliver it direct to the infected plant. So that's something we're looking at. At the moment, we're just uh, identifying the smells, and we know people are working on technology that can maybe apply it. So that's something uh, that would be really neat if we could get that uh, to actually work in the field. Other biological controls are the pheromones. So using the sex pheromones, the aggregation pheromones, that, in this case, insects, give off to attract uh, their mates. We can use pheromones for monitoring. We've used pheromones for monitoring for a long time to tell people when they need to spray. At Harper, we've just uh, developed a new pheromone lure for saddle gall midge, which is much more effective than the current monitoring method. You can use pheromones to disrupt mating. You can make the insects get really confused so they don't find the females. So you reduce the populations that way without actually putting anything on your crop at all. Or, and this is again something we're developing at Harper, uh, my colleague Tom Pope has been looking at the, using an aggregation chemical that attracts the pests towards a killing jar, basically. So rather than you applying pesticide to your crop, you draw the pest to your pesticide. The pest kills itself. And if you're using a biopesticide, you can attract the pest to the biopesticide, it's infected, and then it goes away and it infects its friends and relatives. So you don't need to actually put any pesticide, either a biopesticide or a conventional pesticide, into your crop. The insect, in this case, comes towards its own killing jar. So that's another uh, really good way of keeping chemicals away from your crop. And this has got some uh, commercial applications already. Ex-student of mine working in Germany uh, is marketing this product here, which is a, uh, an attractant with it's a granular formulation. It has a fungus in that kills wireworm larvae, and they're attracted, and they sort of come along, and they ingest uh, the poison. So that's something that's already out there. And of course, there's botanicals. These are used quite widely in horticulture, all sorts of botanicals, all sorts of chemistry that's coming, natural chemistry coming out of plants. Uh, works really well. It's really compatible. You can use the same nozzles. You you know, to use the same machinery. Uh, and we, it works well in protected crops. We're looking to s take this out into the field. Uh, we've asked AHDB for funding to do this, but they didn't fund us. So if anybody out there has got some money and they'd like to fund us uh, to look at actually using botanicals out in the field in an arable situation, we'd be very happy uh, to speak to you. Uh, I'm very conscious that I've been talking about insects, but I am an entomologist. But biocontrols do exist for other uh, pests and diseases. So here's Fargrove's um, selection of uh, fungal biocontrol agents against fungal diseases. Again, mainly uh, glasshouses. This is Aflasafe, which uh, controls the fungi that uh, cause aflatoxin in cereals. This is used in Africa out in the field. Not here yet, but it means it's available for development. Mycoherbicides, so fungi that kill weeds, they've been around a long time, as you can tell by the black and white uh, picture here. Uh, so in the States, you've been able to use mycoherbicides against uh, weeds in uh, rice and soybean, for example, for a long time. 
So there are out there already some of these products. Not strictly biological, but again, uh, non-chemical is the idea of laser weeding. You have a technology, you have a machine, a sensor that can recognize a weed species. Uh, the one we have at Harper, I think, can do 26 species now. Uh, and the idea is that it will, again, however you use the technology, whether it's going to be a big machine or a grid thing or a little drone, it finds the weed and it lasers it, takes out the growing point. The one that looks like a bicycle is in the States, and the futuristic one uh, is how we envisage it might work at, at Harper. Uh, so that's the engineering department working with uh, John Reed, who's our weed scientist. Uh, and we've also been looking at developing this to control slugs. Uh, you can attack slugs with lasers. They don't like it up. Uh, weed control, planting patterns, you don't need to plant in a grid. If you've got this technology, the harvesting technology, the robotics, you can do precision planting, you can do precision harvesting. This is work uh, from 16 years ago in Denmark that showed that you could increase uh, your sowing density, plant in a different way, and increase your yield and control your weeds. And I was pleased to see that it's now actually being used. So this is uh, from Farmers Weekly, where else? Uh, this is an example of uh, something developed by scientists that's actually finally made it to agriculture. It's taken 16 years, uh, we ought to be doing better. We should be getting these things out there faster. We should be communicating to farmers and growers uh, in a much more timely fashion. But it's good to see, here it is, something that people would have laughed at in the past. Here's somebody sowing something differently and getting weed control. Uh, and then finally, there's the, the genetics, the genetic engineering. So CRISPR, we've mentioned uh, Carl mentioned it. It's an editing tool. Basically, it sort of works like a pair of scissors, and you put a mutation in uh, where you want. Uh, we've used mutagenesis in plant breeding for 100 years, usually either ra radiation or chemistry. This is much more direct. It's much more effective. You get the result you want, or at least you get the molecule. Uh, you get the DNA change that you want. It might not always give you the result you want. So this is, uh, again, from Farmers Weekly. So this was a GM wheat trial, and some of you may remember this. The scientists at Rothamsted uh, engineered wheat so that it gave off alarm pheromone, the idea being that the aphids wouldn't land because they would be scared by the wheat. If they'd come and asked us at Harper, is this a good idea, we would have told them, no, it ain't going to work. So those of you, why, why didn't it work? Anybody know why it didn't work? Any suggestions? Who lives on a farm? Do you smell it? Right. You habituate. I work at Harper. I don't smell Harper unless the wind changes direction you turn your nose on. And basically, because this pheromone was coming out all the time, the aphids just, like we ignore motorway signs because we know that says it happened, like, you know, there's, it, there's an accident. You know actually it happened yesterday and they haven't turned the sign off. We habituate to these things because it's there all the time. And that's exactly what the aphids did. If they had a gene that turned it on only when the aphid landed, then it would have worked. So then the chemists needed to talk to the biologists. So, <clears throat> and there are some ethical considerations with biocontrol agents, uh, particularly GM, introducing non-native species, non-target effects, things like who decides what's ethical and who pays for it. Who's going to pay for all the development? Is it going to be industry? Is it going to be levy boards? Is it going to be government? Uh, it's not cheap, it's like the chemical industry. So there are risks and ethics in biological control. Okay? And I can envisage sort of looking forward into the future, two sorts of future. And these two sort of crop habitats, uh, farming landscapes are, I think, our choices. We could go for a highly automated robotic agriculture using highly pre precision directed pest control, either using electronic noses, using uh, visual uh, laser beams, things that can detect the pests, using GPS technology so that you can direct your, you could even use your chemicals because you'd be so um, precise, but I would like to see it as a biopesticide based uh, exercise that you're directing very specific biopesticides to the crop plant rather than the whole crop, the plant, crop plants that need it. 
So you've got your GPS, it tells you where your nutrients are required, it tells you where your pest controls are needed, it recognizes what pest or weed you've got there, and it controls it, and it can all be done robotically, and you could go for a big landscape. Probably not what I would uh, prefer. I would probably prefer something, again, robotic-based with drone sensors, electronic sensors, uh, using biopesticides or, again, very precise chemical applications. And because it's so precise, because you've got uh, ingenious harvesting machines that don't need large fields, that can sort of get in there. And we've seen uh, people developing robot uh, apple pickers. Why not have a, a, a robot uh, carrot that can get into corners? So that you can use your conservation biological control, because you're not using uh, conventional pesticides. You're using biopesticides, so you've got a pretty much chemical-free environment uh, and a very diverse landscape because you're using sort of highly advanced technology. So we could either go two ways, and I guess it's going to depend on how many people there are and how, how much food we're going to need to produce, whether we can go for, whether we have to go for sort of factory, but biologically-based factory farming, as it were, intensive farming, or we can go for a nice landscape and still grow high-yielding varieties, but in a much more diverse uh, way. Right. So that's me done. You can take you can take a seat for a moment. Thank you very much, Professor Simon Leather. Um, before I introduce our second speaker, my head's spinning thinking about all the things that we've just went through. I was desperately trying to tweet some of the things I got through about five percent, I think, of the things he covered in that lecture. Um, before I introduce our second speaker, I said I mentioned earlier on that we're using some technology called Slido, and I said that you can use it to ask questions. So um, please do submit your questions. You can do it at any point during the evening, and we'll be reviewing the questions um, and then ask. We won't be able to ask all of them, but asking some of them in the Q and A session in a, in a moment. When, if you do ask a question, can I ask you to please, especially if you're in the room here, put your name on the question, and then rather than me just parroting it, we'll get you to put your question directly to our speakers, and I'll throw that green uh, ball at you to ask your question directly. So please put your name on it. Uh, but the technology, as well as allowing us to ask questions, also allows us to run polls. So we're going to try our first poll of the evening. Now I'm going to tweak the wording slightly. So the wording there in front of you, so don't answer it yet, hold on. Uh, the wording there says, do you understand what is meant by the term biopesticides? Now, of course, having just heard uh, that lecture, we now all know what a biopesticide is. So I'm going to reinterpret the wording to say, before tonight's lecture, before you heard Professor Leather speak, did you know what a biopesticide was? So here's your chance to play with uh, Slido. So take your phone out. Um, if you haven't already registered on Slido, do, and um, give your answer to that question. Um, so, so far it looks like we're talking to a very, um, a, very a fairly expert audience. Uh, in the, it, it's in people in the room and watching on the internet who can answer this. Uh, we'll, we'll let that clock up and we'll come back to it later on. We'll have a couple more polls uh, later on in the evening. Um, and do ask your questions, put your questions onto Slido and we'll come back to that later on. Okay, um, Professor Leather mentioned in his talk that sort of the bleeding edge of biocontrol, the, the area where sort of the most, some of the most exciting future looking work is being done is in glass houses because you've got a much more controlled environment there. So our second speaker, Dr. Rob Jacobson, is gonna focus on some of the exciting things coming out of that glass house research and where that might go. Um, Dr. Dr. Jacobson has been actively involved with crop protection for 40 years and he's specialized in integrated pest management in glass house crops for the last 30 years, so he's been doing this for a very, very long time. Uh, he also has experience as an extension worker for the UK government, as a technical manager for a biocontrol producer, and a research leader uh, with the UK's largest horticultural research organisation. For the last 12 years, he's been operating as an independent consultant, and he's got a whole host of clients, including the UK's largest tomato producer, Europe's largest independent tomato producer, and Australia's largest glasshouse tomato producer as well as two of the UK's biggest retailers. So you probably noticed a pattern there. He's done a lot of work on tomatoes, and not surprisingly, his work on uh, integrated pest management for tomato crops has led to him winning the Science into Practice Award at the Grower of the Year Awards. Uh, he specializes in the development of whole integrated pest management programs, and he's focused on strengthening some of the weak links in existing programs for high input crops, such as tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers. 
and developing completely new, uh, new programs for lower input crops, such as leafy salads and bedding plants. So as I said, he's going to talk about what's happening in glass houses and where that could be taking us in future. So please give a very warm welcome to our second speaker, our second speaker of tonight, Dr. Rob Jacobson. Well, thank you, Carl. I feel under a bit more pressure than I did when I arrived now. Um, right. My remit is to uh, tell you what we are actually doing in glass house crops. So this is not what we might do in the future. This is about implementation, what is being implemented at the moment. I stress at this early stage that I'm an entomologist and I will concentrate on control of pests. I'm going to start by making a, a very bold statement. Um, I would say that if the ultimate goal in pest management is the cost-effective production of top quality produce in the absence of chemical toxins, then UK protected edible crops are among the most advanced in the world. Now, I, I said I was, it was a bold statement, and we'll see if at the end of the presentation you agree or you're going to shoot me down and say that's not the case at all. Okay, the presentation will cover a brief, brief history of the subject, the driving forces that have taken the glasshouse industry down this route, the approaches and techniques that we've used, the difficulties that we've experienced, and I'll try and provide a few tips for new situations for people who are maybe thinking about embarking on this journey. And I'll end by giving an example of a new program that we've recently had to put together for a brand new pest that's uh, attacking our crops. So biocontrol can't be discussed in isolation. It's, uh, it's in, for, certainly from our point of view, it's, part, it's got to be part of an integrated pest management program. So what do I mean by integrated pest management or IPM? It's not so far removed from, uh, from what Simon described earlier. Certainly, biological control forms the backbone of our IPM program. But we also draw on physical techniques, cultural techniques, and these are all integrated with the uh, careful use of compatible chemicals. So I'm going to focus on the biological aspects of this, but as we go through the presentation, it's inevitable that I'm going to draw on these, on these other types of control measures because they're so important to making our, our biological control work. As Simon has indicated, it's not a recent fad. There was a biocontrol unit in the UK in the, in the 1920s and 30s. However, as interest waned with the availability of organochlorine and organophosphate insecticides in the 40s and 50s. And then there was a resurgence in the 60s and 70s due to work done at the old Glasshouse Crops Research Institute at Littlehampton, which sadly closed quite a few years ago. And that was largely down to this guy. Perhaps I can admit that he's a hero of mine, Joe Hussey. Joe, um, was rather cavalier in his approach to science. If he thought something would work, he would just go for it. He didn't fiddle about in the laboratory for years. And because of that, he actually made things work. And I, you know, I maintain that Joe is the godfather of biocontrol as we know it in our industry and, and in Northern Europe. He produced production units for our two main pests, parasit parasitic wasps to control white flies and predatory mites to control our spider mites. And this, his work spawned several new uh, biocontrol agent, uh, that BCA, production and supply companies in the UK and in Holland. And three of those companies still exist today. Perhaps two of them under different owners, but basically the companies are, are still there doing what they did. But as growers started using these two biocontrol agents, they rapidly became aware of uh, secondary pests in their crops. 
For instance, leafhoppers, capsid bugs, leaf miners, to name a few. Many more secondary pests. They didn't know they were there before because they were previously masked by broad spectrum insecticides. And sometimes they became the most important pest that they had to deal with because they hadn't got a control measure that, would, that was compatible with the parasites and predators against our main pests. So this is my first bit of advice for somebody going down this, about to go down this journey. Make sure you know the full range of pests at the outset. Don't wait until you get into your first year committed to it and find that there's something you weren't expecting. So moving on, um, we had to find compatible control measures for all of these second, secondary um, pests. And this really marked the start of, uh, of what we now refer to as, as, bi as, as integrated pest management. It's, it's already moved on from biological control to integrated pest management. I need to tell you a little bit about our crops because just to put things in perspective, they're very different to outdoor crops as has already been pointed out. They're high input, high value crops. 95% of the crops in the in the UK are hydroponic. They're long season, they're in the, green, in the production greenhouse for over 10 months of the year. With propagation as well, which is done in a specialist propagation unit, they're probably 13 month long crops. <clears throat> and it's a computer controlled environment. Of course, that doesn't take anything away from the grower because the grower's got to set up the computer and he's got to drive the computer, but the, the environment is controlled in that way. They're high value crops. I've taken an average sort of figure there, but typically anything from 450 to 750,000 pounds per hectare per season. We're talking serious money with these crops. But the margins are small. <clears throat> so don't imagine, because you've seen those figures, that there's lots of money sloshing around to spend on parasites and predators. In fact, it really is high risk cropping because if uh, pest control, pests get out of hand, then you can rapidly turn a profit into a serious loss in these sort of crops. Now, of those 95% of hydroponic crops, 5% of them are cropped year-round. This is with supplementary lighting supplied by either sodium lights or by LED lights. And this gives us really good crops uh, for 12 months of the year. The 95%, I said 95% are hydroponic, the other 5% are organic, which are uh, produced in a healthy living soil with, without synthetic inputs. And uh, our, U, our organic growers in the UK may expect more P&D in the root zone, Plant protection options are severely limited. Lower yields, perhaps 20% lower yield than in the conventional, than in the conventional uh, natural season crop, never mind the, long, the, the year, all year round crops. But a higher price if everything's, if everything's good. So if all goes well, there's potential for better overall financial returns. But it's perhaps the risks are probably even greater than in the conventional crops. Now we're producing a good and a wonderful environment here for the production of our crops. We're also providing an excellent environment for, for the pests. We have over 20 species that attack our range of crops. I'm not going to go through these this evening, but you can see at a glance that there's a wide range of insects with different types of, of life cycles, life habits, and mites. Um, we've got a, a big range of pests to deal with. And we have a different combination in every crop. So there's no such thing as a blueprint for biocontrol or a blueprint for IPM in, in our crops. Every crop is a one-off. At any one time, we're typically combating eight pest species simultaneously. There's some common factors between those pests. Most of them have a wide host range, so they can switch between crops if we decide to change from, say, tomatoes to peppers, peppers to cucumbers. 
or even on weeds outside the greenhouse to survive between crops. They breed continuously. We're not talking about one or two generations a year here. For most of the species, it's continuous um, breeding with short life cycles, typically three to four weeks in, in length. So over the duration of a, of a growing season, we might have uh, eight to 12 life, uh, generations. And they have high reproductive rates. So we can rapidly, very rapidly get to this sort of position in, uh, in terms of population growth and crop damage. I guess I'm making a, trying to make a point here in that it's already been said at least once, possibly twice tonight, that, um, you know, or implied that we have it easy in glass houses because it's a contained environment. We can release our biocontrols and, uh, and let them get on with it. We can also control the environment. But it's not an easy option because we've got to deal with this, this huge range of pests and this tremendously rapid population growth. <clears throat> so what has driven IPM in our industry? It began with a lack of effective products for white flying spider mites in the 70s. So this is when, as Simon pointed out earlier, the organochlorine and the organophosphorus insect, um, insecticides began to lose their efficacy due to resistance. And also, we had the need for IPM compatible products for, for the secondary pests and diseases. But I think for, certainly in tomatoes, the biggest turning point for us was in 1988 when we started using biological pollination with bumblebees. This reduced the amount of labor that was required. It improved the quality of the fruit and the yield of the fruit. The, the, uh, the financial benefits were enormous. And of course, once you start doing that, there's no turning back. Over the last 25 years, the financial situation in our crops has changed hugely due to uh, margins being squeezed from all directions. There is absolutely no way a British tomato grower could now grow a cost-effective crop without the use of bumblebees. Therefore, a return to broad-spectrum insecticides is just out of the question. It would. Um, Basically, we might as well close the greenhouse door and forget it. More recently, there's also been some, uh, some retail, retailer pressure. But to be perfectly honest, the, the retailers aren't really telling us to do anything that we're not doing, doing anyway. And when it comes to the most recent pressures, perhaps from the EU, the EU itself and the Sustainable Use Directive, it's it's pretty much irrelevant because we're there doing it all already. So, let's move on to our approach now. <clears throat> the first thing I would stress is that IPM is a knowledge-based system. It's based on a four-way interaction between the host plants, that's your crop, the pests, remember we've probably got six, eight, maybe as many as ten pest species operating simultaneously, We've got beneficial organisms working against all of them and the environmental conditions. And any change that we make is likely to impact on another component of the, of the program. It also depends on topical knowledge. Our decisions are based on regular crop monitoring. This young lady spends most of her working week on one of those trolleys going up and down rows of tomato crops, counting pests, counting biological control agents, checking whether everything's working, checking whether any other action needs to be taken. She works in a 20 hectare tomato nursery in Teesside, which you probably didn't even know existed. It's labor intensive. It requires skilled labor, and therefore it's expensive. My second bit of advice is to anybody thinking of embarking on this journey, staff training is absolutely essential. It's not enough for the manager to know about biological control and IPM. Your staff have to thoroughly understand every aspect of it. We often have multiple control measures against each pest. 
The main controls, uh, our primary controls, are usually the released biological control agents, which come into the two categories of parasitoids or, or predators. We've moved on a long way from the, um, from the two species that Joe Hussey set up in his rear units all those years ago. I haven't counted up recently, but there are probably around about 50 different products available to glasshouse growers now. Not all different species, some might be different, spe different ways of applying the same species, but there's a, there's a lot of products out there for people to use. Now, our, our aim is to provide season-long suppression of the pests with our primary biocontrol agent. But they can be slow to establish in the, at the beginning of the season, and I'll explain in a minute how we can help that. And we may need backup when conditions favour the pest rather than the beneficial during the course of the, of the season. I'll come back to that in a moment too. So let's take a quick look at methods of slowing down the pest. We can put screens on our ventilators to limit the invasion of pests. Admittedly, this isn't a, a method that's used by many growers in the UK because we don't have such huge problems with pest invasion as, as they do in uh, southern Europe. But certainly in specialist units, such as propagation units, screens are often used. Barriers on the floor, sticky barriers to intercept pests. Quite a few of our pest species drop to the floor to pupate and then go back to the, the plants as adults to, lay, to mate and to lay their eggs. You can put a sticky barrier on the floor and intercept them. And we use a whole variety of light traps, sticky traps and pheromone traps to, to slow down the, the pests. We also have methods of enhancing the beneficial establishment in advance of the pest arrival. That might be by providing them with supplementary food just to get them breeding and, uh, and, and get the population going in the greenhouse while the, before the pests start either arrive or start to build up. We may use open rearing units in the greenhouse. These are most, common, most commonly used for parasitoids, for aphid control. But here we, we have a little, this is actually in a pepper crop. There are cereal aphids on that, uh, in that little culture, which are a common host for the parasitoids, but aren't a threat to the, to the crop itself. So we can have our little rearing units there churning out parasitoids. Something similar with culture packs for predatory mites. These uh, little... Uh, Packs contain a, a culture which can churn out adult uh, predatory mites for six to eight weeks. Now I'll take a look at the perfect situation with our primary use of our primary biocontrols now. I was going to apologize for using uh, some what I think are probably oversimplified charts here to, to get my um, ideas across. Whereas Simon's already used something very similar, and he's an academic, I feel uh, <laughs> that it's perfectly okay to do that. So if we look at this chart, which doesn't really need any explanation now, we have, but we have population size on the vertical axis, we have time along the bottom. The pink line is the pest development. And you can see the pest arrives in the crop, it starts feeding, it starts laying eggs, and the population starts to grow. <clears throat> There's an inevitable delay before we first of all find it, then order our biocontrols, then get them into the crop, release them, and they start feeding. And from that point on, the pests clearly got a, got a head start, but it's a, it's a race from that point. The, um, the, the biocontrol is feeding all the time, but meanwhile the pests are, are multiplying as well, until eventually the the biocontrols overhaul the pest and the, whole, and the pest population crashes. Now I say the perfect situation, that would be the perfect situation if your economic damage threshold is in that position. And um, did you say 30 years I've been working? Well, I wouldn't have had a job doing this for 30 years if it worked like that every time. So, Unfortunately, this is 
more often the case. The uh, economic damage threshold is something like that position. So what we happen have there is the potential for huge losses when we go above this, um, this orange line. So this is where we bring in a, a, a second line of defense, I call them. So what happens there, you see what we've done, I'll go back a slide again. We bring in our second line of defense and we just knock the top off that curve to keep, it, to keep the pest population down to acceptable levels. I call these second lines of defense or SLODs. The key features of an SLOD are that they must be quick to apply, so they're usually a spray of some description. They've got to be quick to act because we're very close to that orange line, so we've got to, we can't wait for long before they start to give us a result. And they also have to be compatible with all the other biocontrol agents that we're using. Remember, we're talking about a biocontrol against one pest and one pest getting out of hand here. There's another five, six, seven pests trundling along there being controlled by their biocontrols. If we use something that disturbs them, okay, we cure one problem, but we create another. So whatever we do has to be compatible with our entire biocontrol program. But, here's a real positive for me, we don't need sort of 95 to 100% control that we'd be looking for from a chemical pesticide used on its own. Often 50 or 60% kill is, is adequate just to redress the balance between the pest and the, and, and the natural enemy. In my view, it's the availability of this, these second line of defense products that's provided a safety net and has really helped our industry to move forward with biological control. Even if you don't need them, it's a great comfort to the growers to know that they're there as, as I say, a safety net should, uh, should something start to go wrong. Traditionally, uh, there have been target-specific chemical insecticides, but more commonly now, we're, we're moving on to biological alternatives. Now, all of the methods I'm, I'm going to mention very briefly now, and I can really only give you a flavor of what we're doing, they're all being used in some way against, um, as a second line of defense treatment. Nematodes, fungi, uh, mic microorganisms, that's BT, Bacillus thuringiensis that you can see there, and a whole range of plant-derived products. Those actually are African chrysanthemums from which being grown to harvest and, uh, and produce natural pyrethrins. All, of course, grouped together as biopesticides, as Simon indicated earlier. <coughs> and this, but this hasn't been a, a steady progression since Joe Hussey's day. There have always been new challenges. Just as we think we've cracked it, new pests arrive from overseas. Or existing pests change their status. Aphids becoming resistant to the target-specific chemical perimicarb was uh, a, a, a good example of this. Some of the new speciality cultivars that we, that we now grow, that, and we're dependent on those for the higher value that we get from the supermarkets, um, are more susceptible to pests. Now, what that means is that that orange line is pulled down so we have to take the secondary action earlier and it has to be more effective. We've also lost some of our important target specific chemicals. You know, thinking here about chemicals such as fenbutidine oxide that used to be highly um, specific to spider mites without harming the predatory mites that we use against them or anything, any of the other biocontrols for that matter, was lost not first and foremost through resistance, but really for economic reasons. We just weren't using enough of it. So uh, it was no longer viable to market it in the UK and, uh, and, we, and we lost that really valuable product. And we, I, you know, I'm the first to admit that we're still learning how to get the best from biopesticides. 
we can't treat them just as straight alternatives to chemicals. They're very different and have to be used in a very different way. There are also um, potential for biological complications. And I'm going to give an example here of uh, parasitoids that we use against aphids. That brown football-like thing is a parasitized aphid. And one of our good guys is inside there eating out the contents of the, of the mummified aphid. The black wasp on the surface is actually a hyperparasite. It's come along and it's in the process of laying an egg into the mummified aphid and its own offspring then eats the good guy. So eventually a bad guy emerges from the, from the mummified aphid and this whole process of hyperparasitism has caused us some huge issues with aphid control in pepper crops during the summer. So far we've found 10 different species in our pepper crops, 10 different species of hyperparasites. There's also something called intragill predation. Just because you've got four or five natural enemies that you can throw at a particular pest doesn't mean that it's, it's a good thing to use them all at the same time because you may well find that some eat the others, which is exactly what's happening in those two pictures. So I come back to the point I made earlier about a thorough knowledge of, uh, of the system being vital. We also have some marketing challenges. <clears throat> I think you'll agree this is what the public, probably including every one of us sitting in this room, has come to expect. Unlimited supplies of perfect produce, year-round availability of all your fruit and vegetables, and everything at rock-bottom prices. You know, will our customers accept a little bit of imperfection, an occasional pest, an occasional good guy even? Well, it would make life very much easier if they did, and our losses uh, would be very much less if, if um, we didn't have to grade things out for these very reasons. So I would say not at the moment. There are also cost implications. First of all, research and development. With a broad spectrum insecticide, the research and development is almost entirely done before the product comes on the market. 20 or 40 million pounds, I believe, it costs to produce a new insecticide. With biocontrols, they're so variable that generally you don't really start to do the, the research and development until you put them in your own crops because at, they're, they're all, uh, they vary, the results vary depending on, on the conditions in your own crop and you've often got to tailor the, the whole approach. The multiple control measures that I've described in IPM are more expensive than the use, routine use of a broad spectrum insecticide. I mean, a single broad spectrum insecticide may take out several of your pests in one go. So you, you're probably using many fewer products overall. And then you've got the additional labor for crop monitoring. And you know, people who, some people will disagree with me, but in my experience over all those years, IPM is usually more expensive than a chemical-based program. So who pays for it? Gross margins are already small. They've got to be allowed to make a living, otherwise who's going to produce the food for us? Are the public going to pay more? You know, our crops, uh, in real terms, are, are, are worth less now to us than they were 25 years ago. Food is, fresh food and vegetables have never been cheaper. Far too cheap, in my own opinion. Well, that doesn't mean I want to pay any more. When I go into... Uh, Sainsbury's or Tesco's and see um, the Stella, two, two for one, buy one, get one free. I don't quibble about that. I'm more than up for that. I don't feel the same about the tomatoes. And, but will the supermarkets reduce their margins? I can see a few smiles around the room, but 
can make your own judgments on that one. So I think the, the economics have got to be addressed here. You know, there's no doubt that this is the way we should be going, and, uh, and this is the way the Sustainable Use Directive is going to force everybody to go, but the economics have got to be addressed. Okay, I'll now move on to this example that I said I would give of a new IPM program for our latest tomato pest, Tutor Absoluta. You probably think that's quite an amusing name we did when we first heard it. We had a few, few giggles about that. Not for long, though. It arrived in the UK in 2009 and would become, already become quite widespread in 2010. The adult is a small speckled moth, as you can see there. why that's not oh right it is not um, they soon started to cause some serious damage the first crop I got involved with the grower lost 60,000 pounds a hectare over a two-month period in the first summer that he had this pest in the crop it mines in leaves and it mines in the fruit and once it's there and there's a possibility that it could be inside the fruit, of course, who wants to buy your fruit then? Which supermarket's going to buy your fruit if there's a possibility that there's a big fat caterpillar inside it? So it affects not only through grade out losses, but also through uh, marketing problems. So we had to design an IPM program, and we had to design it fairly quickly. The, the pest had come from South America via Spain, the Spanish at the time were throwing every pesticide they could think at it, at, of at it in all sorts of cocktails. I've already explained why we couldn't do that, because of our bumblebees, there's, there's no way we could go down that route. We had to find an IPM program quickly. If, um, so if you consider that red line to be our pest population through the season, starting, say, December, January at the top and running right through to November at the bottom, we felt at the outset we needed four components in our IPM program. The first was a method of monitoring the pest population to help us make decisions. The second was a primary biocontrol. The third was a second line of defense to help us to adjust the pest biocontrol balance mid-season, should that be necessary. So that's our second line of defense. And possibly an end of season cleanup, depending on what sort of pest levels we were left with at the end of the crop. So let's start with the me method of monitoring the pest population. The female produces a sex pheromone to attract the males. This was, has been identified, it's, um, it's been synthesized, and it's incorporated into those orange lures that you can see there, which are placed inside sticky traps. So the male thinks he's on a hot blind date here. He zooms into that trap from, all, from somewhere in the, in the greenhouse. And as you can see from that little guy next to the rubber uh, lure there, he's come to a sticky end. They only attract males, of course, but they're, an ex they're excellent at detecting low level of infestations in the greenhouse at the beginning of the season and helping us to make decisions throughout the season. Let's move on to our primary biocontrols now. For this, we have a predatory bug called Macrolophus. Now, this little guy has a long piercing mouth part, and he can probe into the leaf, and he can feed on the caterpillars through the leaf. So that caterpillar has been pierced and sucked dry of its contents by our biocontrol. But they can be quite slow to establish. It may take three to four months to build up a good a good population in the greenhouse starting in, uh, in January, say. Usually by, uh, well, from May, June onwards, they take control of the, of the pest. But by that time, of course, we can have gone way past that orange line and the crop, uh, the, 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 economically, the crop's finished. So we quickly realized that we needed some extra components in our program. We needed means of slowing down pest establishment. The most successful that we've tried so far is mating disruption. 
So we saturate the air in the glasshouse with this same sex pheromone that I've already described. It's incorporated into these little plastic, look like boot laces, which are put onto the crop wires. Now, we didn't use a lot of them. We use up to 1,000 per hectare. And it confuses the males, and the males can't find the females, and the results have been absolutely astounding from this. It's early days, but it's so far very, very good at slowing down the pest population. Expensive, £750 per hectare, which is 1.2% of the farm gate value of the crop. But compared with losing 10% of your crop over, uh, over a month in the summer, it's, um, this is money well spent. Other ways to slow down the pest, well, use of light and sticky traps, and also sticky floor treatments. This is one of the pests that does drop to the floor to pupate. Some of them do anyway, not all of them, so it, it can only be a contribution. It can't be an entire control measure in its own right. But there you can see we've caught some caterpillars and we've also caught some adult moths on the sticky treatment underneath the crop. Okay, so that was means of slowing down the pest. We also thought we'd have better have some means of speeding up the, micro, uh, the macrolophus establishment. After all, three to four months is a long time to wait for your biocontrol. And we've managed to do that by providing them with some supplementary food at the, at the outset, which helps them through at least the first generation and gets them, gives them a good start in the greenhouse. The best method we've got here is, uh, is the use of a stored product moth egg, a feastier eggs, which of course have no impact on the crop at all. Right, so we've um, got our biocontrol up and running in the greenhouse. We've slowed down the, the pest establishment, but sometimes things go wrong just through weather conditions or for, for, through for factors that are way beyond your control. So we need the second line of defense. The first one is a target-specific product, um, Corrigin, chlorantranilipril, which can be applied as a high-volume spray and it's translaminar, so it penetrates the leaf to kill the caterpillars inside the leaf. It's highly specific, it has no, so it has no effect on our, on our biocontrols. The second product we've got as a second line of defense is uh, spinosad. Now this, you, could, you can think of it as a biopesticide because it's a, a, a fumigation product from a soil-borne fungi. It's not particularly um, target-specific and it will kill our macrolophus. So the breakthrough for us was when we found that we could put it through the irrigation system and it would, be, it would pass up through the plant systemically and, and get the pest from inside rather than outside and then it is compatible with the, with, with the biocontrols. These are different chemistries so that provides us with some sort of resistance management strategy. Although we are already seeing problems with resistance to these products in Southern Europe. And unfortunately, because we still bring in a lot of produce from Southern Europe, we are probably acquiring resistant tutor absoluta from on those imports. We also have um, second line of defense, a uh, second line of defense product for organic crops, and that is Nentomopathogenic Nematode. We can spray that onto the crops through our the same equipment that we use for spraying pesticides, all we have to do is take the filters out. And we can get 40 to 60% control of the medium-sized caterpillars in the middle of the, the canopy, using that as a high volume spray. I probably have to put two or three sprays on to have, a, have an impact on population growth, but at least it's, it's something. And as I said before, we don't need to get 90 percent plus control with these second line of defense products because we're simply trying to slow the pest down. Right, well that's pretty much it. Um, what I thought I'd do is just sum up some of those tips I've tried to give along the way. So anybody who's thinking of embarking on this journey, this is a reminder of my uh, suggestions, points that might help. Staff training is vital. You must know exactly what you're dealing with, not just your main pests. For instance, I helped a company in Australia to set up a, 
um, an IPM program, switching from a, an entirely chemical-based program, the first thing we had to do was grow a portion of the crop for a season without any pesticides just to see what would turn up from what we were dealing with. We need to establish a full armory of compatible products for all of those pests. We need to include the second line of defense products as safety nets, and we need to anticipate higher production costs. And never relax, because always be prepared for new challenges. There'll always be something to come along to catch you out. And uh, that's all, so thank you very much. If, um, if anybody wants any more information about what we're doing in, uh, in Glasshouse Crops or what my own company does, if you look on my, my website, there's um, quite a lot of information there, certainly enough, enough leads to point you in the right direction. So once again, thank you. very much Rob that was absolutely fascinating um, really exciting glimpse into sort of the world of where, where biocontrols are being used in the sort of a most, most advanced way in glass houses and I guess one of the lessons for me is if, if we're going to see more extensive use of biocontrols in, in outside of glass houses one of the less one of the things that's almost certainly true is that pest control is going to get more complicated than it is at the moment um, okay, we're going to take a short break now while we reset the stage. We're going to bring both of our first two speakers back up on stage for our Q&A session. So I'll just remind you, if uh, you've got any questions from anything you've heard so far or any, any questions about biocontrols and where it might be going, submit them via Slido. Please put your name with the question because I'm going to try and get you to ask the question directly using the green ball. Um, so we'll see you in 10 minutes back here. So there's some drinks, I think, and we can take a comfort break for 10 minutes. Thanks very much.
Welcome back. If you can see, the stage has been transformed. We're in comfy seats up at the front, and we've got about 25 minutes to have a bit of a Q&A. Um, I'm going to ask another poll question in a minute. You can still ask questions at any point during the Q&A, so do use Slido. I have, a few of you have come up to me in the break and said you're having trouble connecting to the Wi-Fi. Um, so I'm also going to take questions from the floor by hands. I know there's at least two people who had questions that they haven't been able to submit on Slido, so I'm not going to make it stop you from asking questions. So we'll use the old-fashioned show of hands as well. Um, okay, well, let's kick off, though, with our second poll. Um, so can we have it up on the screen? And again, you just need to use your mobile phones, and you can do this at home if you're watching at home. I saw someone watching at home with their dog earlier on, so I know we do have people watching at home. Um, so our second poll question, oh, that, that's the result of the first one. So did you understand what was, what's meant by the term biopesticides? So most of you did, 85%, 20 of you responded, 85% of you did know what it meant before the presentation and only 15% didn't. So that's good, we've got quite a knowledgeable audience tonight. Okay, our second poll question, can we have that up? Is it coming up? Um, anyway, it's on, it should, if you go to Slido, it'll be on the screen on Slido. The second poll question, I'll read it out, is what is the single most important factor affecting your likelihood to use biological controls on your farm business? Um, and so the three options are price, availability, or efficacy, i.e. does it, the fact that it, how well it actually works. Um, so if you can put your answers to that up and we'll leave it up on the screen and come back to it in a moment. Um, Okay, so looking, we have got some questions in. I'm going to ask, uh, this is actually one I noticed has come in from Charlie Wilson, who I know isn't in the room because she's watching at home with her dog. She was tweeting about it with a picture of her dog watching the screen, so I know that the live streaming is working. And her question is, um, precision agriculture is at the forefront of much farming conversation at the moment. How integrated is biocontrol with precision technology? So they're two distinct but very fast developing fields. Can they work together? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, it's, I guess, a pipe dream, which is what I was sort of pointing out. But I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be fully integrated. I think they'll be very compatible once we, you know, from our point of view, once we identify the volatiles that different pests and diseases give off, uh, and then it's up to the engineers to get the drone technology or the whatever they're going to use. I, I leave it up to them, <laughs> whether they use drones or whether they adapt uh, sort of tractors or harvesters that have a whole lot, array of sensors and nozzles on the front. I mean, I think the, the world is their oyster once we get the, once we identify the volatiles and the people like Rob get the biopesticides working, <laughs> then the engineers can implement it, so. Well, I personally think they could make a huge mm, contribution yeah. to the application of uh, the macrobials, that, as I call them, the, um, uh, the parasites and predators. Because, you know, if we've got to treat an entire field just because we've got pests, a few hotspots of pests in there, uh, but we don't know exactly where they are, it's, it's going to be a hugely wasteful um, process. If we can send a robot in that goes up and down the field, picks up where the, um, where, where the little hotspots of pests are and, and there's a dollop of biocontrol material there or a, a spot spray for that matter depending on what sort of product we're using. That, that would make a, a huge difference to the success of, of these sort of techniques or the cost effective success of these sort of techniques I would say. Are we seeing any of that happen, starting to happen <coughs> already now in glass houses? Because I know there's quite a lot of technology already in glass houses. I can't think of any examples in glass houses yet but then remember we're working on, on a much more uh, confined space and um, I suppose it's, it is more uh, practical to, to actually walk that entire crop and, mm. and, and do it manually. Now I see the really big benefits of, of doing this on a, on a, on a, um, a crop, you know, field scale. A broad field, yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay, one of the questions that from someone who couldn't submit it through Slido was from Peter, Peter Gadd. So I'm going to, here we go. To you, Peter. Excellent, well done. You can speak into the black Bingo. Part. 
Um, yes, uh, both um, t two sort of main points and then just a final supplementary. Um, it seems to me that the big problem from, from a lot of farmers' perspective is that it's the environment that we have to control in order to get the best use out of many of these opportunities going forward. So glasshouse environment, um, I'm just wondering whether, uh, Rob, I think you touched on it briefly, but looking at lighting, and you talked about growing crops 24-7, 100% output. I just wonder whether UV lighting or other forms of lighting could be used to enhance the biopesticide effect and reduce the effect of the the pests that we're trying to knock out. Um, from the point of view of broadacre cropping, um, I just wonder whether a combination of, of biopesticides in conjunction with more sort of gene sequencing of the crop's DNA, such that we could enhance, again, the biopesticides that we're using and inhibit the actual pests. And I'd use cabbage stem flea beetle in oilseed rape as an example of where some varieties of oilseed rape will inhibit cabbage stem flea beetle feeding. And the supplementary was, who do you think should be funding some of this, or even all of it? Do you think it should be blue sky, BBSRC type work, and government involvement, or do you think it should be near a market, AHDB led, and maybe leveraged funding? I think we've got three questions there. Yeah. I think the first one was about uh, manipulating lighting, which is probably the one I can answer and then I'll hand over to Simon. Thanks. Um, we already have examples of, uh, of using plastics which can modify the spectrum of light which reach the plants in polythene tunnels and that sort of thing. Uh, and and they, they can have an impact. Of course, we've got to be very careful what we do because I, as I tried to explain in one of my slides, every change we make is likely to impact on some other part of the IPM program. <coughs> so for instance, if we, if, if we do take, I think you mentioned UV light, if we take the UV light out and suddenly we have a problem with bumblebees finding uh, the flowers to, to pollinate them. So there's, you know, it's never quite as simple as, as we think. Uh, and I think this is something that often catches students out because they're, they're usually looking at one particular control measure in isolation and get all excited when it works and it's not until they come to talk to us at the Tomato Growers Association and, and tell us what a wonderful idea that they've got that we point out that well yes unfortunately but then our bees won't work <laughs> you know so but but certainly manipulating the light spectrum has huge potential benefits under polythene tunnels I'm not quite sure how you go about that in an open field situation. Okay, so, okay, so uh, Rob's left me two questions. Um, the first one about using gene manipulation uh, in conjunction with biopesticides, yeah, I think if you can make, say, the oilseed more resistant, then that slows the pest down and the biopesticide will then have the chance to, to work uh, more effectively and sort of more, not more quickly in, term, in, uh, in actual time, but more quickly in terms of the development of the insects. So yeah, I think those would be very compatible and a, a good, good approach that you, you make, use, a, use the partial plant resistance to make them more susceptible to a biopesticide. That should work pretty well. Uh, the funding issue, uh, as somebody who initially used to get funding from the Agriculture and Food Research Council, which some of you may be old enough to remember. Uh, in those days, we used to have a lot of agricultural funding. When the BBSRC was invented, uh, it was very noticeable that f funding towards agriculture did sort of really almost disappear. Uh, it was, I mean, in my opinion, the BBSRC has basically been hijacked by a lot of people doing biomedical research, dressing it up as uh, other research. Uh, and because you look at some of the things and you think, why isn't the MRC funding that? Uh, so I think really the, it, we should get a lot more blue sky funding from the BBSRC. They should actually readdress their um, priorities and actually look at funding agricultural research very much more seriously than they do at the moment. Uh, that said, I think uh, the levy boards should also play their part 
uh, and I guess we should also think uh, the agrochemical industry should sort of get in there too. Uh, so, but I do think it, we do need some more blue sky from BBSRC. <coughs> to hold that for a moment, because I, I want to bring in the next question, which I think in some ways is sort of the $64,000 question, and it's from Jack Richardson. I'm not sure if you're in the room. Jack, ah, he is, and he's very close to you, Peter, which is good news. So, a short hop. Could you speak into the black dot? That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. So my question, as everyone can see, is how far away are we from widespread biocontrols for the use in large-scale commercial cereal crops? And I'd like to add, uh, my biggest problem at home is slug. So if anyone could solve them, that'd be fantastic. Interesting you should say that because I think we're probably closer to controlling slugs than most of the other pests with um, uh, with nematodes, for instance. You know, we, we do have a biocontrol agent that is perhaps it could possibly be used on a, on a large scale. Uh, I think the challenges for many of the other pests are, are much greater, in fact, at the moment, yeah, because we haven't necessarily got the, the tools in place. That doesn't mean that we, you know, we can't get there in the, in the near future. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, as Rob says, I think slugs are probably the most amenable. I mean, at Harper, for example, we're, we're looking at uh, better ways of tracking the slugs. So uh, Tom Pope uh, and Keith Walters uh, are both sort of looking at radio tracking, finding out where slugs actually hide so that you can uh, put the biocontrol uh, options uh, in, in, in the neighbourhood of the slugs. Uh, so making it more efficient. And, and I think, yeah, for large-scale commercial cereal crops, for things like the aphids and stuff like that, um, it would be nice to think that we're, it might happen in my lifetime, <laughs> uh, but I'm not sure that it will. Uh, it depends on how the, uh, how the perhaps sort of fungal control using myco uh, pesticide-based things against cereal aphids or uh, the midges goes. But, you know, I I'm hopeful. <laughs> but it's certainly not going to happen tomorrow. I think some of the <laughs> biocontrols, some of the biopesticides are there. It's just we don't know how to use them to best effect. And it, leaving aside some of the plant volatiles, which I think uh, probably have a different mode of action, most of the biopesticides that we have available to us now reply, uh, depend very much on contact action. So first and foremost, we've got to get those biopesticides, those products, into contact with the target organism. And that is probably the, the, first, you know, the, the, the first problem. Um, how do you get a, a target organism under, on the un, onto the underside of leaves? It's probably, we've probably got to rethink spray technology. You, know, you can get away with an awful lot of uh, spray inefficiencies with chemical pesticides that will um, that have some sort of vapor action once they land on the leaf or penetrate the leaf, have some form of translaminar or, or limited systemic action. You don't necessarily have to um, spray, get entire crop coverage. But with most of the biopesticides you do, you have to, you have to hit the, the target organism. And that is probably one of the biggest problems to overcome. There is a, an AHDB horticulture uh, project running at the moment. It's called AMBER, which is looking at, that, at trying to improve biopesticide use in protected edible and ornamental crops. And I think we're, I, I'm a, sort of a, have a minor role in that as a, as a consultant to it. I think the experimenters uh, are making some really good progress already in, in understanding where those biopesticides have to go and the best way to get them there. And I think there'll be a knock-on benefit there to all of the crops. So I, you know, I, think, I think we're making progress. But that's really, I think in the first place, that's, that's the way we've got to go. Get, I mean, getting the biocontrol in contact with the target, maybe that is an area where the combination <coughs> of the biocontrol and precision Technology Absolutely. might help us. Absolutely, but even even if you know which part of the field you, uh, you're, you've got a hotspot of pest disease, 
you've still got to get that target, get that biopesticide into contact with the target organism. And if it's on the underside of a leaf in a dense canopy, it's, that's a real challenge. Maybe that's a cha I, know, I know that Harper Adams, as well as the lovely mm. entomology <coughs> department, you've got a fantastic ag engineering yeah, department, I mean, and they're yeah. working on some fantastic techniques to pin oh, yeah, put stuff so with pinpoint accuracy on plants. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the, the, the whole, I guess, um, ambition is that we are able to combine the, the detection and the application uh, in, into one into one super cool machine. <laughs> Can we get the <coughs> results of that second poll up again? Um, which was about what factors might hold back, assuming it was available, mm -hmm. um, what would hold back. So it seems pretty clear it's efficacy. Mm -hmm. So if it works, that we'll pay for it. it works well, that would overcome um, what people are saying would be the single most important factor mm -hmm. affecting I, their likelihood to adopt biocontrols. Mm -hmm. I think the result on price might be a little misleading because I suspect most people don't yet <laughs> appreciate how much some of these uh, non-chemical programs might actually cost their business. But I guess if you're, yeah. one of the things about price is if you're comparing with today's prices, mm. that's maybe not a fair comparison because mm. I guess in the so medium to long term, we're probably not going to be able to continue to farm in exactly the same yeah. way as we farm now. So costs are probably yeah. going to go up anyway. Mm. Yeah. And I, it's interesting, to, sorry, I, I'm, we have uh, access to a screen down here, so I keep pointing down there. I can't see this one, but I can see a screen down in front of us. And it's interesting that the availability just popped up yeah. to 12%, because I'm surprised availability isn't higher, actually, be, because I, I would have thought availability of useful products, if we're looking at, a, at an entire pro, um, program, then, yeah, I think a, availability is, uh, is a serious issue. <coughs> Maybe that just shows the supreme confidence of the audience in your ability to <laughs> sort these problems out. Um, Did it go up again then? <laughs> when they I are, every time <laughs> someone else votes, the, the numbers change, I know. Um, there's, a, there's a question which is submitted anonymously, so I'm going to read it out, but I think, again, it's a, an area that, that I gather is quite an important area. This is about regulatory, the regulatory regime. Does regulatory legislation need to change to make it easier and less expensive for manufacturers to bring biopesticides to market. Now, I have heard it argued that the current regime is making it particularly hard and maybe is unfair against biocontrols. Is that true? Uh, it's, uh, well, could I actually link that to the next question as well? Yeah, because please. I keep looking at that and you've jumped, you've jumped ahead of it and it's been irritating me ever since I saw it. It says, why are the US so far ahead of us in the area of biocontrol? So in, many in many aspects, they're not, and I would, uh, I, would, I would definitely say they're not. But in terms of availability of biopesticides, they certainly are. And that, I believe, and I'm certainly no expert in regulatory um, legislation, but they certainly seem to have a lot more biopesticides registered in North America than, uh, than, we, than we have in the UK. And I think that does come down to the complexity of our system um, and that there really doesn't seem to be a, a way at the moment of, of simplifying that or you know you, you seem to have to just put the product in and and wait for it to churn through the system so it is part of CRD yes and many of the same, I think they do have a different process within CRD, but it's based, I believe it's fundamentally based on the same principles. Um, and of course, you know, the, I, I'm, I, I'm really rapidly getting out of my depth here because I'm not a regular, you know, specialist in, in regulation, but it, um, yes, it, it, it does seem that our system is, is overly complicated, and I would like to see it simplified, certainly. I mean, I sort of go along with that. I've certainly heard um, numerous colleagues who are sort of involved in the, the development of biopesticides who do complain bitterly about the legislative aspects. The, the other bit about why the US so far ahead of us in the area of biocontrol, uh, if they are, and again, uh, Rob and I think perhaps they aren't that far ahead, but one of the reasons is that the, uh, 
in the United States, the uh, university system is much more geared towards training crop protection specialists. So they, they even have departments of entomology. We haven't had a department of entomology in a, a UK university since ooh, 1980s, I think. And when I was an undergraduate, there were seven, there was, I mean, seven, which is a lot compared with what we have now, but with the states, it's not very many. There were seven specialist degrees that trained crop protection specialists and at undergraduate level, and there aren't any of those really left anymore. There's no entomology uh, degrees, uh, though we are starting one next academic year. Uh, so basically, entomology training is postgraduate and crop protection training tends to be uh, very much postgraduate in the UK. So there aren't as many of us, <laughs> which you know puts you at a disadvantage straight away. I, I should stress, <laughs> if you do get the chance to look around the department there, it's absolutely very impressive. When I, when I was there, there was a chap who, who had the most steady hands I've ever seen, <coughs> gluing like a wire to an aphid, to the back of an aphid, and I don't know how he managed to do that. Uh, very impressive. Um, I, I was going to come on to another anonymous question, but I do promise I'd open it up to people from the floor who were struggling to answer, ask their questions by a slido. So, show of hands, are there any, before I come to the next anonymous question, are there any? There's one down, it's Andrew Ward down the front here. So, that's a bit of a further throw. Andrew, you can make yourself ready to receive. Excellent, 100% success so far. Yeah, just a very fascinating and interesting uh, evening we've had. But what we've just seen, will this satisfy our good old friends or the environmentalists who are against everything we try and do in crop production? So are the environmentalists very positive about biocontrols or do they have another set of problems? I mean, I'd, I'd say they, they would very much welcome um, something, anything that would increase sort of conservation biocontrol. Uh, so I think they would be very much on the side of biopesticides. What do you think, Rob? Have you, have you been in touch with any of them? Uh, or have they been in touch with you? Um, I, well, I, I may, of course, only, only th yeah, perhaps the only ones who contact me are the people who are interested in it. But I've certainly, I mean, I've been doing quite a lot of stuff on uh, conservation biocontrol for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years now. And the farmers that we use are always very interested in how they can make their... Um, sort of headlands mm. more compatible with uh, natural enemy production. Uh, so, uh, and my contacts on interactions I have on Twitter, I guess the sort of greener side of people seem to be on side with that, that approach that I think they certainly regard a biopesticide approach better than a you know, much, much better than a chemical approach. Um, whether they would be as keen on the, the future where you still keep the large-scale farming and use biopesticides, or whether uh, they'd probably be more towards the side of the small, you know, more diverse cropping and smaller fields. So. You're obviously but, better at putting your side of the story across to the, uh, your um, uh, counterparts on Twitter then than I am with glyphosate. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I, th there was an excellent speaker at the <coughs> Oxford Farming Conference, I think it was two years ago, who was talking about using biocontrols on a farm in Kenya. And she argued very eloquently that, um, that the, the, the regulatory regime should be relaxed in Europe to make it easier to get you through. And, and I thought her argument was one which would go down well with those with strong environmental concerns, which is that in most cases, these controls are things that are already in the environment. So you're not introducing something totally new the environment so some of those concerns about you know you just don't know what it's going to do because there's no experience of having it in the environment that you aren't often aren't that you just don't have those concerns with biocontrols you know, so I you would hope they would be a bit more i would say really I'd, and there are lots of different agendas that's the trouble aren't there but in general terms i would say they should be really pleased that this is and see this as a positive way forward they may not agree with every aspect of of what we're doing, but as a general way forward, it's, it's surely got to be positive. Um, but I, I'm intrigued by your question in a different way because I'm, something's made you ask it and I, I would like to turn it round and perhaps you could tell us what you've got in mind specifically. You mentioned glyphosate, is that...? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm active on Twitter on, on helping to try and save glyphosate and putting the good points across about why we have to use it and, and sort of you know, how it's environmentally friendly and, and all the usual things. 
but they're never backwards in coming forwards and saying that I'm, I'm talking rubbish and that all our arguments are, are one-sided and, and they're absolute rubbish. And I just wondered from that, that point of view well, you know, whether they're on your side. Well, that doesn't really sound very constructive, does it? So, no, exactly. Yeah. No, it doesn't. So, I mean, yeah. you, you know, we've, I, I say in general terms, people should see it as a positive mm. way forward. There may well be, yeah. some, be some good arguments about in some specific areas, but they've got to be presented as good arguments and they can't just be, uh, you can't just be sort of shouted down and told that everything you say is, is rubbish. You, you know, we're trying our best, for goodness sake, to, to feed the world in a, you know, in, in a way that uh, has minimal effect on, on the environment. And somehow we've got, to, we've got to feed this population that's growing I'm sure somebody's got in the room has got the figures, but you know, and by the, the, the population is growing enormously. The, um, we're chopping down rainforests for extra agricultural land, yet we're still, as I understand it, losing 20% of food that's produced either in the field or in in store. And before we start, before we chop down any more rainforests and create any more agricultural land, surely it's better to find ways of reducing that 20% loss. And, um, you know, I, I, I would have thought that the, what we're suggesting is, mm. you know, is all moving in that direction. Um, I know we're tight on time. I've got another question <coughs> at the back, so I'm definitely going to take that. Can you throw that? <laughs> yeah, go on, James. And, you go James, James got one more poll. <laughs> no more polls. Right, so um, I think we're going to have to make this the last question, I'm afraid. Right, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, can I just ask the professor, how far are you away from not commercial trials on biopesticides, but really being able to bring it out from being nearly like a lab situation into something that maybe you might be thinking about small scale trial and looking at comparators and things like that. How, how is it looking for you? I mean, given, given the funding, I mean, I, I think we could do a a trial, you know, almost immediately, if somebody would actually put forward the funding for us to, to get out there and put, put something out in the field, you know. We've got, got the facilities at Harper, we could, we could do a small scale, you know, so can like a hands-free as, as farmers, can we then help through the government um, uh, process to try and get some money from what I call primary um, look-see, in other words, not taking it to near market and nonsense like that. Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, if, we can put, if we got a group together and said, yeah. look, this is important to take it forward. Yeah, I mean, that would be very welcome. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of... I think that's the way Farmers Weekly that would welcome that. Carl, uh, I think Farmers Weekly that. want to disseminate yeah. it well yeah. and get ask people to like, come mm. in on like you did yeah. on glyphosate and things mm. and, yeah. and hedge cutting get people to sort of say, let's take this forward mm. as part Be of our noted. future. Yeah. Sounds like a challenge. <laughs> Sounds like a good challenge. Yeah. Who else wants the ball? Uh, if you hold on to the ball, because I think we're going to have, unfortunately, we have to end the Q&A bit now. Um, but actually, one of the questions asked earlier may be able to be picked up by our final speaker, because I know there's probably not many companies that have as much experience as Syngenta at sort of taking products through the very, very complex regulatory process. So I don't know if he's going to touch on um, how that applies to biocontrols. Uh, but first, can I just thank you, big thanks again to our two speakers from the first part of the, the session, to Professor Simon Leather and Dr. Rob. My, your, your name's gone completely from my mind, Rob. I'm getting so old now. And Dr. Rob. Try harder. Jacobson. <laughs> Dr. Rob Jacobson. Please give a big round of applause to us. I don't know if biocontrols can do anything for Alzheimer's. Um, okay, our final part this evening, and to wrap it all up, um, I'm very pleased to introduce um, our speaker from Syngenta, Max New... Newbert. So, yeah, it really is the early onset Alzheimer's kicking in. Um, who's going to talk about oh, yeah, what is Syngenta's interest in? What, why is Syngenta interested, interested in biocontrols? So, please give a big round of applause to Max. Yeah, so we've heard from uh, different sectors of the market, but now I'm going to move on to what the industry sees uh, in biocontrol and how it 
has been mentioned many, many times, is an integral part into an integrated pest management program. Um, and what has been touched on in that last Q&A session was what is the overriding issue uh, in the industry of agriculture right now, which is an ever-increasing population, uh, but then actually the reduction in our ability to year-on-year year improve those yields to match that population and feed ourselves. On top of what you see on, on the right there, where we've got a finite amount of land and we've got what, 0.3 of a billion hectares of undefined land left, which could be used, but as we said, it's probably rainforests. So what we actually want to do is not use that and make the most of what we do have and get the highest yield, yields possible. Um, and as we said, we'll need a figure. So uh, this is from Jason Clay um, at the Worldwide Fund of Nature. And we can see in the next 40 years, we're going to have to produce the same amount of food we had produced in the last 8,000 years due to the increase in population we are going to have within that time. And obviously, you can see that's going to be a huge challenge for ourselves um, as well as the rest of the world. And then to throw that into the context of how do we keep producing that yield, we obviously want to keep crop protection relevant. Um, but what we're ever always seeing is that increase in costs that industries having to pay for, uh, for regulatory reasons to get a pesticide registered. And as you can see here, um, in sort of 1995, you're paying a total of 152 million. Um, the research part of actually finding the, the component of a new crop protection uh, product was about 72 million. And actually, if you see relatively close, so we're still uh, nearly a decade now, out now, uh, but research was 85 million. So actually, that's, that's pretty good. We, we've kept it in line with inflation, basically, there, because we've increased, uh, increased throughput of trying to find those active ingredients, and we've become better at discovering um, those AIs and producing them. But what has dramatically increased, as you can see, is that development cost, which is doing the trials and getting all the necessary data of those AIs for the registry process. So that's what our big, big opposition is. And as we mentioned uh, with biopesticides, we still have that issue. In some ways, it can be a bit easier because what the EU does now, we have a, 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 risk, a hazard based uh, system where if it's a hazard, that will be cause the main issue with it. So obviously, biopesticides have reduced hazards, as we all said. We know how they act in the environment, and we know that they're probably very low hazard. Whereas uh, sort of traditional chemistry has a high hazard but potentially low risk but the risk is now not what we really see as the issue. So just to sort of reiterate those points, um, because of that increased cost, we're actually seeing a reduction in funding into making AIs, which has caused now basically for the industry, we're producing about 1.2 new AIs a year compared to the 1980s, where we're doing about four. And then on top of this, we have, as we all probably know and well aware of, are the EU uh, withdrawals outpacing actually the input into the industry. So we're at this sort of standpoint in history where we're losing a lot of active ingredients, yet the, uh, the world needs more from us. Uh, so we've got this really stressful moment really for the industry. And on top of that, we've got, because of those regulatory issues, a smaller and smaller active uh, chemical space we can look for new AIs in. So the top there, the sort of best case scenario, the area of all the active ingredients we could find, along with their mobility in the soil and their persistency. We don't want them too mobile and we don't want them too persistent, because then they'll get to places we don't want them to be, and then they'll be in the water courses, etc. And at the bottom there, you can see what is more like what we're sort of working in now. We've got a very finite amount of space we can find those AIs, which fit the sweet spot of actually being, have a good efficacy of being an AI and being an active ingredient, but aren't causing issues for the environment or for non-target pests. So where biocontrol sits is perfectly in that space, where it's going to have high efficacy, but we're going to have very low hazard and risk. Because really, what should be happening in biocontrol is that you've got a product which has very specific activity, but for the environment in general and for us, the users, the consumers, much, much safer. So what I'm going to try and show you today is how Syngenta's put a lot of power research behind this because we see ourselves as one of the best developers of biocontrols um, and what we're going to see now in this presentation is an RNAi approach. 
So what RNAi is, is a very specific way to control pests. It's a different mode of action, because what it's actually doing is interrupting uh, organisms' natural processes of producing a very useful protein that it will use to do something integral to its, basically, existence. What's fantastic about this approach is that it can actually be used just like you would use any other crop protection product. So you can spray it and apply it to a crop. So it doesn't mean you have to have a new infrastructure to apply this. And it can be, what we've all been saying, compatible with other approaches, which is fantastic. And with, a, uh, with RNAi, you'll also see that will be compatible with beneficials and other biological approaches. And, but all the time giving you that very high efficacy level that we want from a product. So how it works is that you spray double-stranded RNA onto your crop as a foliar application. That will go onto the crop, and then the pest will consume that double-stranded RNA. It's a natural process with higher organisms, basically anything higher than yeast, will have not see uh, double-stranded RNA as something it should have it within its body because a lot of the time that will be a viral piece of RNA, double-stranded RNA. Usually we only have single-stranded. So what it will do, it will chop it up and those small bits of RNA will then split apart and what they will do is attach to, if they've got the specific sequence, attach to a very specific part of the organism's messenger RNA which was going to produce a protein, attach to it and then induce that same effect where the animal itself or organism itself will chop it down, remove its own messenger RNA, producing no protein. So you're making a block to something that could be very essential for the organism, such as replication, uh, ion channels, anything that you might imagine would be essential for the pest to propagate perfectly. But then what also this means is that because you're making it to a specific gene sequence, you can make it highly specific. So you, as in this image here, you can see we've got rid of all the bugs, but we leave the bees perfectly alone well, they're not being affected at all, but we've got high efficacy. So this is a quick video to show you that in actual uh, motion. What we have on the left is a treated plant with RNAi targeted to Colorado potato uh, beetle, and then the untreated on the right. And a period over about five days, what you'll see is that as they're taking up the RNA, they'll be able to stop producing a certain protein, they'll die off, and there won't be any uh, predation except from the very first day or so on the treated and on the untreated. They'll uh, continue to grow, eat, and at the very end of this video, you basically see a stick of a plant left, which is about 189 hours, I think. So as you can see, decimation. So obviously this is a, sort of a Latin America problem, but you can see the devastation that caused by those pests compared to the RNAi uh, spray plant. So fantastic results, high efficacy, very specific, which will be shown in the next slide. So these two bugs, Colorado potato beetle and the milkweed leaf beetle, very highly related. Um, different species, but very highly related. What we produced was two different RNAIs to target each one specifically. So what you can see on the left there is when we're targeting the potato beetle at the top, we target the potato beetle, but not the blue milkweed beetle. Then we go on to test the RNAi targeted at the milk uh, weed beetle, and we again target it. But if we combine both of those RNAs together in a mixture, it, we can kill both. So you've got high specificity, and you can make mixtures. So that means you can then, if you've got a certain set of issues, you can make these mixtures and produce, on the right there, um, wonderful levels of control and tailor it to your specific pests. So that's all well and good. I've showed you it in basically lab conditions. But what we've all been saying is, how does this get to Broadacre? How does this get to the arable landscape? And because I was saying it can be used as a foliar application, just like you would spray in normal insecticide, you can take it to field level. And so in this trial, we had a, 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 a plot which was highly infested with the Colorado beetle. And it was sprayed, as you see at the top, the uh, RNA-based control and the entries underneath. And you can see the stark difference there. And what we saw, it was highly effective, not against only the adults, but also the larvae. As long as you're targeting something that the pest is going to be producing throughout its life cycle, it's going to be effective for its life cycle, as long as it can get into the, the, the pest. And most importantly, we saw it was statistically equivalent to traditional approaches. So this means it's not, you're not losing out on paying more for a product which 
potentially cannot work as well as normal uh, crop protection AI. And what is most important, what we've been saying uh, about beneficials is obviously we ha usually have thresholds of spraying so you don't kill the, uh, the beneficials that might predate on the pests. It doesn't have any effect on the beneficials. So what you're getting is a fantastic product which is killing off the pest, target pests, but leaving beneficials to also help you wipe up any of the leftovers. And no phytotoxicity as well. So all round a fantastic uh, new product and could be cusp of a new future for uh, crop protection. But what's always been the problem with RNAi approaches is RNA technically is very fussy. It always breaks down, which in some respects obviously is fantastic because we know once you sprayed it, it's not going to last around. You won't have any problems with having it staying on your crop as a residue. But even if you did, RNA, RNA is everywhere, so that's not even an issue in itself. So that problem with being breaking down the soil was um, assessed in this trial where we formulated it so that it would persist long enough to actually be a viable control. And in this, it was a corn rootworm, so not relevant for Europe again, but goes to show what it could be used for. And what we have in this trial is the RNA uh, I approach at one times uh, concentration up to four times uh, in a formulation where it makes it persist, makes it work better compared to just straight amounts being concentration. And what you can see when we formulate it, you can really get a very high level of efficacy even in soil, which previously thought could be a difficult situation for this uh, type of crop protection. And what we see is that if you formulate it, you can get nearly as good levels, well statistically, as good levels of control at four times when you just do it at one times the formulation. So this, this is the next step. We're seeing that this is a real viable technology, four levels of crop protection. And then the other issue we always thought was, oh, okay, so how do we get this RNAi approach into a sucking pest? So obviously at the moment we've been spraying it on things that chew, which means it's on the surface of the plant. But what we find is that because RNA is a natural thing, and we have seen it in natural processes, it can go across barriers. It does work for sucking pests. It penetrates into the plant. As you can see here, the green stink bud, which is a sucking pest, it will enter the plant and protect it over those 13 days compared to the control. So we sort of established that if we work hard enough and formulate well enough, we can actually make it an effective approach for crop protection. So, so just to sum that up, I, but we can see this is going to be really huge for the potential future of crop protection. Syngenta is going to put a lot of power into this because it has all the sort of benefits we want. We've got high efficacy, we've got high specificity, and low risk and residues, and it's, uh, it's a really good product. And to make sure that we're transparent and open with the public and yourselves, we've got an approach where you can go to our link here and actually look at the data that's behind some of this, what I showed you today, to make sure that we don't have any issues with people understanding what this approach is and what it means. Because actually this is a fantastic approach and could change agriculture. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Well, that, that's, uh, that, I found that really encouraging, actually. So uh, it's good to see that something, hopefully, I mean, I'm not expecting it on the market in the next few weeks, I guess, but uh, that, that, that looked really promising. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'd love to run another Q&A session now, but I'm afraid we haven't got time. But uh, just a few final things. One is that for those of you in the room, please feel free to hang around. We've got some more refreshments at the back, and if you do want to ask Max some questions, I've certainly got some questions for him, um, he is going to hang around a bit, and the same goes for our other two speakers. Um, if you've enjoyed this Arable Horizons, I see some of you who've been to at least two or three of the other sessions. We have one more in the series. It's that one over there, which is on climate change. Uh, so if you're interested in applying for a place at the final Arable Horizons lecture, which is being held in Cambridge, um, I can't remember what the venue is, but it's somewhere in Cambridge anyway. British Antarctic, uh, Survey. British Antarctic Survey. Thank you, James, in Cambridge. Um, then please go to the website and uh, you'll find all the information about it there. Um, I want to once again thank Syngenta for making this all possible and for supporting what I think is a really worthy enterprise. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, and can we give one final round of applause to all of our presenters tonight?
for those, those of you watching at home, that's the end of tonight. For those of you in the room, let's go and have some more refreshments and continue the discussion. Thanks.